So now we have the, the final <coughs> the final talk for uh, this afternoon, which is uh, Jack Williams in God and Culpability. All right, thank you everybody. I believe I'm sharing my screen. So I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, so I'll be presenting today on God and Culpability, Morality and God through the lens of hermeneutical injustice. So the basic argument of thread I'm going to try to pull things together uh, with is I think there's ethical considerations for reorienting a discussion of God and morality from a more explicitly um, from from using the, the use more explicitly with analysis from the mar marginalized communities in the history of uh, religious systems. And so then I'm going to try to develop that use the, if if that if those motivations are somewhat correct, I'm trying to develop that using the feminist concept of hermeneutical injustice uh, with the goal of this being to see if those motivations synced with a hermeneutical notion of hermeneutical injustice can lead to some interesting ideas um, about the relationship between God and morality. So one potential takeaway being uh, if it ca calls into question any notions of God's divine attributes uh, or another one being either calls into question a, a notion of God as the sole source or ground of morality. So to kind of begin the talk, it's worth mentioning how the traditional, how I see the traditional approach work working. And uh, it should be noted that I'm not trying to say that this is going to be an argument against traditional approach. I actually think there's insights from it um, that we that, that are, are important. But I'm trying to see what would what, what, what could be done if we went from an alternative approach. So, but the traditional approach is from how I see it, uh, example, demonstrated pretty clearly in Stephen C. Evans's work, God Moral Obligation, as well as others, where basically you're trying to see how God is some necessary ontological ground for obligation or ontological ground for the good or the virtuous. And so you then work, work to see whether God is necessary or not necessary for those things. And Evans has done great work on that in terms of the compatibility between obligation, good, natural law theory, and virtue ethics. Um, but one of the things that I've become increasingly at least a little more interested in is whether or not uh, those kinds of analyses assume too much in the background. So there's lots of maybe some background issues that before we can get to a full notion, a uh, full, full analysis of those kinds of questions of God as a source, whether there's other practical commitments we have to attend to first. And that's where I become interested in some motivating alternatives for maybe reframing the discussion. So um, this is where I kind of draw explicitly from the feminist tradition of philosophy. So Marilyn Thee argues uh, in her work in the 90s, uh, trying to recenter philosophy of religion more generally to issues of injustice, issues uh, making what would previously been background issues of one social identity and how that places one in a religious community or one social identity and how that, that places one within a theoretical space. Uh, I think that there's reasons for foregrounding those issues and how, because one, how, how one occupies a space might, uh, might give them certain conceptual resources or values that might be distinct or lead to different kinds of evaluations in the philosophy of religion more generally. So I'm interested in that and uh, how the Maryland Thee's work can motivate that. Uh, I'm also interested in how um, uh, more contemporarily uh, Michelle Pantrick, she she's done some work on hermeneutical injustice and has regards to religious trauma and spiritual violence and um, how the people who are in marginalized situations in, in the religious communities, how that if, how that the consequences of those things are some kind of um, strong in, there's, a, there's a strong incapacitation of how one can experience one's own spiritual life, which would be religious trauma and spiritual violence in terms of how one can conceive oneself in relationship to God in a religious community and how normative concepts, whether it's natural law theory and how it uh, delimits one's understanding of uh, a true and good sexual relationship or a true and good gender identity. I think centering those conversations will lead to some interesting uh, and necessary questions that philosophy of religion must face, particularly as you embed those concepts within a broader history that they've been around for um, a good bit of time, at least in the, the Christian tradition. So I think there's practical issues as well in terms of how um, humans are related to themselves and God that uh, I think God and morality discussions might benefit from. And finally, uh, I think there's also something to be said about practical uh, 
or ethical considerations in relationship to the fact that if if the way we talk about God is primarily from one kind of social location, then we might be missing out on, uh, as Marcel Althus Reed argued in her uh, book, Decent Theology, some kind of pathway for God's own liberation. So if, if there are alternative conceptual resources for articulating God, there might be some good reason to want to see if, if there's other modes of understanding that might lead to a more rich understanding. And I think we can probably tell that those are going to be some different questions than the traditional approach. Um, so, but again, I'm not trying to say the traditional approach is inherently wrong. I'm, I'm just, in, I've been interested in how the, those alternative approaches might be revealing on questions such as God and morality. So what I'll be focusing on now is how marginalized knowers and their resistance and innovations against dominant traditions, against dominant resources can be, can be a, a breeding ground for interesting avenues of thought for God and morality. And so how I'm gonna develop that now is with the notion of hermeneutical injustice. So I tell that story through the work of Miranda Fricker, Jose Medina, and Gail, Pol Gail, Gail Polhaus Jr. And so what they agree on is that hermeneutical injustice is a particular kind of epistemic harm related to a community's shared conceptual resources. And so when, when we understand a shared conceptual resource, how I understand that at least, is that it's, it's one's conceptual resources available for them to articulate their own experience with some kind of relationship to their social identity. Uh, so Paul S. Jr. separates that into two categories that I find helpful. Uh, so there's situatedness, which is how one uh, interacts and uh, inhabits a certain world in relationship to their uh, to relevant social identities and how that social and how that inhabitation leads them to be salient to certain features in the world over others. Then there's also the notion of interdependence as one inhabits the world in, in a certain way in virtue of their situatedness. Those with similar kinds of situatedness are gonna to work together in order to develop conceptual resources for articulating that kind of inhabitation. So a super benign example is if someone is some kind of forager, they're going to uh, as they, they take foraging on some hobbies, they go into the forest a lot to find some kinds of resources and such. And uh, the more they spend time in that, they're, they're going to become salient to certain features in the environment. And they might also develop a, some kind of acquaintance with the foraging community to develop conceptual resources for then understanding what they're seeing. That leads to more nuanced and uh, intensified kinds of interactions with their foraging activity. And then this is a, this dynamic relationship between how one acts and how one understands their actions. When it comes to hermeneutical injustice, the first kind of harm that, that all three scholars talk about is a harm of when the situatedness of a person does not lead to interdependence relationships where they can understand their situatedness. There's a lack of conceptual resources available, which is in virtue of some kind of I, their identity having some kind of marginal, up, mar, they're, they're being marginalized in, uh, from the dominant culture. So one of the common examples in the literature is uh, from the women's movement with sexual harassment, how sexual harassment, while it's a, it's a, a key tenet of business law today, was not always there, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't modes of sexual harassment before, this means there wasn't the same kind of social consequences and conceptual resources for understanding it. And so before there were, uh, women oftentimes had these experiences of physical and emotional or emotional harm uh, lead from sexual assault that was that, there wasn't the kind of necessary institutional or conceptual pathways for understanding those things, which seems to be a both a, a harm for the women in terms of understanding their own experiences, but also leading to social harms. Uh, you can also, I think, uh, quickly make draw an analysis to someone uh, with religious mar marginalization, such as I mentioned earlier with uh, uh, LGBTQ identities and understanding themselves in relationship to God with natural law and how there weren't very many resources up until too recently, at least the resources that are publicly available um, for those who have those identities. And that would seem to be some kind of harm. So that's one kind. Then the second kind is when, despite situatedness leading to interdependence relationships, so a community uh, being human rational agents that they are, even if they're in really terrible situations, uh, they can resist and develop uh, localized hermeneutical practices that they can use to apprehend their experiences. 
and so that the the problem isn't an interdependence relationship. The, this problem would be where, despite forming these conceptual resources, these resources are then not received by the dominant community in uh, in a more broad way. This is another kind of harm of one's self understanding, but also a harm that leads to important social uh, difficulties. And so, one that comes um, to mind that isn't discussed as much, but I think is, is a relevant one, is like, uh, in terms of disability studies, where you have um, community, you have communities of people with chronic illness who experience pain of some kind that is often invisible to the others. And despite having uh, uh, clear health reports in most normal kinds of ways, they have this persistent pain or this persistent ailment. And where they are able to develop conceptual resources within communities, either via the internet or in, in their local community. But there's countless stories of these people also going to healthcare professionals and the healthcare professional just simply sending them away saying, oh, your, your numbers are not nice. Uh, this, and so I, and I don't know where your symptoms are coming from, but you should be happy that they look good. Your, your numbers look good. Um, try to drink coffee less and uh, don't be too anxious which seems like an obvious social harm for someone with chronic illness uh, with chronic pain. So that would be some kind of marginalization. Uh, additionally, for re religiously, you can also kind of understand this where even where there are situations where uh, women, for instance, were able to develop conceptual resources for understanding themselves in relationship to God and others, they're, they're the dominant community did not uh, take up these, these resources in any kind of clear cut way and oftentimes try to push them down, um, we, which you see with some of um, probably combine some female mystics and such. So both these seem to represent clear harms. Where the Fricker, Medina and Polhouse Jr. disagree on is what kind of culpability would be involved in these issues. So Fricker says that the individuals aren't culpable for these kinds of actions because they're collective structural problems and no individual person says this concept means that and we should exclude that concept. This kind of happens via dynamic interactions of, of people. Uh, another reason why Fricker says, oh, that doesn't seem to be individual culpable is due to the fact that there are clear localized uh, hermeneutical practices where a dominant knower just literally might not understand the marginal knower's experiences or conceptual resources. So Fricker wants to say there's a certain bit of reasonable ignorance that might be afforded to individuals. What's important though is Medina and Polhouse Jr. pushed heavily against that. Uh, so what they say is Fricker needs a, a more problematic, a more problematized notion of community, because even if you're in a pretty self-enclosed community, you're going to have moments of disruption where your conceptual resources might not hit exactly right in explaining something. And there's going to be th th those moments of disruption could lead to alternative explanations or alternative ways of inhabiting a certain kind of situation that should lead to an understanding rather than maintained ignorance. So Medina and Polos Jr. argue that the fact that there is a persistent ignorance on the part of the dominant knowers in the face of potential changes means there must be some kind of self-interest or some kind of more, uh, some kind of epistemic vices leading this continued maintenance of ignorance. And so the basic idea here being ignorance isn't necessary. So if it's, if it's existing, even if it's, even if it's really hard for understanding to be to be gathered, there should there's 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 a responsibility. Medina cashes out in terms of a prima facie responsibility to rectify hermeneutical gaps. So this is going to become particularly important for when I later try to apply this to the discussion of God, God and morality. Um, but the basic idea that I want to follow along with is Medina and Polhouse Jr. raise the raise the stakes of ignorance and raise the stakes of not rectifying such ignorance. So if to kind of bring this back to more uh, religious language as well, so we have St. James who says, so for the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it for them, it is sin. Fricker would say, knows the right thing to do. Well, the dominant community doesn't exactly know, so they're not exactly culpable. Medina and Polos Jr. would say, no, they're not off the hook. The right thing to do for them, they know, which is to undermine their own ignorance by gaining understanding. They fail to do that, so they're culpable. And additionally, you can you can be culpable, according to Medina, if if you if you fail to act in a way that rectifies hermeneutical gaps. So the responsibility to act in some kind of way. And uh, Medina properly 
nuances this with feature, like there's, there's gonna be certain people are gonna be more responsible than others in terms of rectifying these gaps, particularly if you are knowledgeable of these gaps, but you don't rectify it, that seems like super problematic. So how does this apply to philosophy of religion though? Uh, so I'm, like I said, I'm trying to motivate an alternative perspective of God and morality. And I think there's interesting things from scholarship from feminism. And I think there's interesting things in, in scholarship about the marginalization that's happened within the development of scripture and the development of religious traditions. So now I'm gonna to try to start making, drawing those connections more clearly. And I appreciate your insights as I try to do this more clearly uh, going forward. So I want to make sure I establish the, the God of the philosophy of religion as kindly as I can possibly do so. And uh, people have talked about four, and there's just, you know, the, the talks leading up to what I'm doing right now. But there's omnipotence, omniscience, all good, all loving, all merciful, all just. All these things work together, not in a way like a pie chart, but permeating all of who God is. I think a safely safe conclusion that we can get from that is God would seem to know and do, be able to do the right thing. Where we get into more problematic area is uh, according to these traditional understandings in the philosophy of religion from the Christian tradition, God participates in God's own self-revelation in scripture. God participates in God's own self-revelation in the conceptual resources of traditions as they're developed. But there's a pervasive history of conceptual resources that seem to reinforce exclusionary practices, both in scripture and in the development of traditions. I think that poses an interesting, at least, at least it poses an interesting problem that um, I'm not sure what the conclusion is yet, but I, I have leanings towards one, obviously. God is purported to participate in religious systems of past and present. Religious systems have historically excluded gender, racial, and sexual identities, causing religious trauma and spiritual violence. Uh, someone who I wasn't able to talk about in any kind of specific way, but I will just briefly mention is a theologian Andrew Sung Park, who talks about the, the South Korean uh, language of Han, and that which represents this kind of deep, hopeless, and um, a social, individual, personal, psychological harm that permeates once once these kinds of exclusions happen. I think those those are worth taking seriously. So we then we have God knows God knows the right thing to do. God can do the right thing. I think following Medina, we might be able to say that. God has a high obligation to reduce hermeneutical, gap, hermeneutical gaps. Uh, but it seems that God doesn't reduce these hermeneutical gaps in any kind of strong way that undermines any, in, at least in the, in the time scales that we're dealing with, with the development of religious doctrines, both in scripture and outside, in post scripture. It doesn't seem to be any kind of time sensitive reaction to these hermeneutical gaps from dominant to marginal knowers. So God seems culpable in some, to some degree for failing to act. And I think that presents an interesting problem, at least from the marginalized perspective, beginning from these injustices. So kind of laying out what I late stated before, if we look at how God would be placed in these issues of hermeneutical inequality, this hermeneutical gap, obviously God's not reasonably ignorant. Obviously God, if he's already not ignorant, he doesn't fail to know. The big problem and probably the big question mark for whether or not this argument works is in what sense is God prima facie responsible to rectify these hermeneutical gaps? So some implications I just want to gesture at and then um, hopefully I'll just kind of move to the Q&A to see what y'all have to say. But I think there's some, I think there might be some reason to, that there might be some motivation beginning from kind of the the bottom and moving up to higher notions of God's character, there might be some reasons to uh, avoid culpability by reimagining some of God's omni-attributes. So what if it may, may particular probably omnipotence would be in question here. If God can't do the right thing in these situations of hermeneutical gaps, but God can only work towards doing the right, can only work with people for doing the right thing, then you might not see a God who is culpable because God does actively resist in ways that are appropriate to his prima facie, or I'm sorry, their prima facie responsibility. Another possible implication that I think would be interesting is uh, God and communities, rather than God being the sole source of uh, these obligations, virtues, or goods, uh, given the dynamic nature of moral innovations and conceptual innovations, be, I think it'd be super interesting to conceive of these things rather in, in the way that where communities are resistant and innovative and God is a part of that resistant and innovative development 
uh, which I think reorients the discussion of God as the source of good, where it's not God is maybe the source of good, but definitely not the sole, so the sole source. So I think those, those interesting questions that um, kind of develop from a, a analysis of God and morality from the perspective of marginalized knowers and hermeneutical injustice. Uh, we're running out of time. I was going to look at one objection. I have two others that if they're brought up. I can just go to the slides. Uh, someone might say, well, this is a problem. This isn't really a big problem because, of course, even if God, God gives us free will, so they decide for themselves whether or not you want to do good or not. But I think the, the unique thing about hermeneutical injustice, at least from my perspective, is it's not solely about God making or making people do this or that. If God is involved in God's own revelation and the conceptual resources that develop in traditions and scripture, it seems plausible that God could do something in some kind of appropriate way to include rather than exclude or at least question more, more concretely exclusionary practices. So what I've kind of tried to do in this talk, I'll wrap up, and I'll wrap up now, is try to say there's, her, there's interesting things going on with the feminist concept of hermeneutical injustice. There's interesting things going on with trying to re, reorient a discussion of philosophy of religion from the marginalized perspective. And I try to put those together in ways that could lead to some potentially interesting implications. But for that, I'll stop now so we can get to Q&A. Um, thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Uh, very interesting talk. Okay, so first uh, question, Professor Taliaferro. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this. I um, deeply admire your um, direction of your research and your presentation. I had just have two suggestions. Um, one is that it's it seems to me I, I've done actually a fair amount of recent work on this on the problem of racism and philosophy of religion and also um, addre addressing issues of marginalized groups and the like. And uh, in a book called Is God Invisible, um, my co-author and I work hard to um, build a case against um, the nefarious ways in which we treat each other as invisible. Um, if you look up just uh, who's invisible, you get hundreds of, of hits by Native Americans, by uh, uh, Hispanic Americans and by others who um, said, look, we're invisible. And the idea, what you try to link the omniscient God of um, the Abrahamic faith, theistic Hinduism, and the all-seeing eye of the compassionate Buddha, who's often pictured with eyes looking in all directions. And this the traditional view, um, Occidental as well as Western and Near Eastern and the like, does give one an avenue that so many people crave being visible. Um, so that's getting the traditional attribute of omniscience and also compassion. Um, just one question, one other point briefly is that it does seem to me in black theology, you get a lot of material in which God is understood pretty much to be black. And so J James Cohn, who died maybe two years ago, well worth looking to enhance that. A question mm -hmm. I do have for you, um, mm -hmm. but you can comment on any of that, please. Uh, excellent talk again. But I've noticed a, a tension between, um, more recently, in the past 30 years, between what could be called impartialism, whereby we try to take the ideal impartial points of view, and partialism, you know, where you really are um, you know, Black Lives Matter, and uh, Pence will say, I think all lives matter, and people respond, well, uh, actually, right now, it's, we, we, we're taking partial sides here. Do you have a comment on that, the, the, this new direction that you think would be fruitful for philosophers of religion? Um, do you have a view on impartialism versus uh, advocacy, which is really mm -hmm. your, your you're advocating for, say, um, unarmed black men in my city where George Floyd was killed. You're not, you know, you're, you're being selective. What, what do you think? Yeah, thank you for both those comments and directions I can pursue, then as well as the question. Um, really quickly to the comments. Uh, yeah, I, I, th I, I'm, I think I'm, 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 I'm very happy with looking at kind of those going beyond even Christian tradition to look at the Buddhist tradition and the American traditions to kind of understand that 
uh, perspective about omniscience and the invisible. I think that sounds great. And the compassionate, I love James Cohn. He's a fantastic writer, invigorating writer with so much. Uh, yeah, so I, I appreciate those. In terms of that question, I, I'm, I'm very much influenced by um, a philosopher at Georgetown, uh, Quill Rebecca Kukla. Uh, their research kind of, they, they have a paper from the early 2000s where they kind of talk about difference between um, uh, a, a, being without objectivity and uh, having a perspective. And so where I would kind of make, what my thoughts are about the, the partiality versus um, impartiality or par impartiality and having a perspective is, I think this is kind of also where maybe I side with some Jose Medina stuff. I think given certain kinds of social structures uh, and maybe agreed upon social structures, we can recognize uh, that there is a, a maybe objective kind of uh, prima facie responsibility for us to pursue the certain kinds of equality and freedom um, or the expressions of just kind of pursuit of life and as in that we we can kind of appeal to such kind of impartial facet of our existence and then when it comes to kind of the perspectival needs of certain communities over others i think that we can we can lean heavily into kind of how we we lean heavily into the perspectives of we don't the impartiality doesn't mean we neglect perspective it just means that we we need to be very nuanced in how we apply these kind of broader social structures of access to equality and access to, um, yeah, just general ways of life. So I think we can, I think that we can, we can, that, that there's a tension there, but I think that given certain kind of social structures and social agreements that we can, we can enter into kind of that, that tension confidently. I hope that makes sense to your question. If it, no, it makes sense. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so, any other question? Actually, I have a question. I would like to know something more. Uh, I mean, you mentioned briefly like the classic responses to the problem of evil, which seems to me this sort of uh, version, more socially, uh, you know, oriented version of the problem of evil. What you say with the ex on ex exclusionary? Uh, can you go back to that? Uh, yeah, let me uh, share my screen. Sorry, one one second. Uh, was <clears throat> was it was it this slide? Or uh, it's no? like one of the last ones. Uh, Perverse is the conceptual resources. No, no objection. Yeah. Okay. God control determination or God participation in exclusionary conceptual resources. Uh, what do you mean exactly? Like, uh, say, the Bible, for instance, uh, defending uh, or proposing uh, some uh, exclusion toward marginalized blue. Can you expand more on this core, please? Yeah, so I think it's a, it's a mixture of both. So I think that you get it both in kind of the biblical traditions, uh, but you also get it kind of post-biblical where, I mean, you can trace it to early church fathers, you can tra trace it to medieval theologians, you can trace it to the theologian in a college nearby like so i think there, there's going to be there's going to be places where uh, it exists more prominently um so I, and yeah so at, at this at, and when you get to and so what i what i think i was trying to say there because it, the fact that there's been such a long time scale of exclusion makes me think that what if we reorient the discussion in general because if if, if, it, if it's taken like thousands of years of social institutions, social structures to get where we are. What if the importance isn't the God as the objective grounding? What if, what if the importance is something else, such as the resistance of marginalized knowers in throughout these throughout these religious traditions? And so, because of that, I don't think I think it's worth saying that. Well, yeah. So because I think God is not not off the hook just for appealing to because we're we're at a different place now. Thank you. And what do you think of the fact that, uh, you know, religion historically is born used, I agree with you, to uh, like to regulate society and to oppress minorities, but at the same time to inspire movements against mm -hmm. the oppression. See, I was thinking about uh, the Methodist role in uh, the US in uh, the abolition of slavery, for instance. Mm 
or uh, liberation theology, the various strands of liberation theology down here in South America, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the black uh, nationalist uh, in the US, like Malcolm X and stuff. So it seems to me that religion can play uh, both, can be both an instrument of uh, like marginalization and also an instrument for, say, to inspire uh, liberation movements. I mean, historically, they both are. Uh, so, I mean, you can pick and choose, of course. Like you can see, I don't know, slavery is written in the Bible, so it's or mm -hmm. you can see, say, like the main this look at the Bible, <laughs> slavery yeah. is wrong, or uh, say only in Christianity, without going into the the galaxy of the various uh, black nationalism, Rastafari, or whatever. Yeah, and I and I think. It's it's kind of it's exactly that kind of complexity that I'm actually I'm, I'm trying I think I want to capture more because it, it feels like in the traditional post religion look which is lots of those kinds of the need for liberation the need for those kinds of motivations are kind of backgrounded and so we're seen as the God is the source of these goods but we what we're not seeing is the resistant communities that were in, engaging with God so I'm I'm comfortable with um, God as being this active participant in the the community's resistance like and towards liberation i'm just uncomfortable with maybe some of the narrative that goes behind such things so it, it feels like the the traditional account might not be able to be as nuanced about whether or not in, when, when god participates in the dominant community versus god participates in the mild marginalized community i want to be able to say yeah there's there's you, you can get maybe both bits but can you get both bits if you're talking about the traditional God and how long the traditional God waited to to liberate the the marginalized communities in terms of LGBTQ stuff, women stuff. So I, I think I, I want to go your route. I just think I want to maybe I, I want to go there with a the route of focusing on the marginalized to get there. OK, thank you very much, Jack. So uh, any other question? Dinner time, so people are starting to disappear. So, thanks again for uh, see. Down here is like six thirty-six. So, thanks again, Jack, and uh, yeah, pleasure to have you here. So, uh, I think this is uh, this is it for this afternoon. So, we will have one hour break, more or less, and uh, we are coming back at seven thirty with uh, Professor John Greco and then with Duncan Pritchard. So, epistemology night, and. Uh, so I'll see you in an hour. Thanks again for your interest in this conference and uh, I'll see you in an hour. So enjoy your Thank dinner you. if you're on this time zone. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Cheers. See yes. you later. Ciao, ciao.